It is Friday, June 24th. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello everyone, welcome back. We've got kind of a slow news week here, but not really because we are very close to what should be some exciting news. And so that's what we're going to be going over. But for the time being, let's start with our PS Plus reminder. So those PS Plus June Essential games are still live. Go ahead and grab those. We should be finding out very soon what those July games are going to be. And for our first story, let's talk about PS Plus officially relaunching in Europe, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and most other remaining markets. So we're finally here. The new PS Plus is relaunched globally. Um, so we've got the new tiers, essential, extra, premium, deluxe, um, classic games, streaming, no streaming, game trials. It's all finally here. So hopefully you're either enjoying it or maybe you're still contemplating uh, subscribing to a certain tier. But uh, one thing we did look at yesterday was the UK storefronts relaunch. And that's where we did confirm our suspicions that, yes, they are using PAL PS1 games. Disappointing, but shortly after publishing that video over on Twitter, the PlayStation Europe Twitter account did confirm here. And I quote, we're planning to roll out NT options for a majority of classic games offered on the PlayStation Plus Premium and Deluxe plans in Asia, Europe, Middle East, India, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand regions. More PlayStation Plus info here. That is fantastic news to see, and that's what I was getting at in that video, is that, um, you know, let's give Sony the benefit of the doubt for the time being, because I think what happened here is, uh, you know, granted it was still very perplexing that they rolled out PAL games in the first place, especially in territories that, you know, historically did not have them before. And so, yeah, there's language options, but um, that was perplexing. But I think what happened here is that they, you know, went ahead and did it. The complaints started to roll in and they just weren't going to have this ready in time for the Europe launch. So, Either way, um, it's still good to see that they are uh, addressing this soon. Now, one other problem that we talked about <clears throat> in last week's episode was for a siphon filter, where if you claim that game on PS3's PS Plus 10 something years ago, then you couldn't re-download it on PS4 and PS5's new PS Plus. And uh, well, as we've seen before, uh, yet again, after I published the video, that problem was fixed. So good news there, if you were having an issue before, try it now, you should be able to re-download Siphon Filter on your PS4 or PS5. Uh, I will say though, it seems like it's still a problem if you try to re-download on PS3 or Vita. So those old platforms with that license, it still seems like it's messed up where it's uh, the game left your download list and you can't uh, manually search for the game and re-download it that way. So you may have indirectly lost the game on PS3 and Vita. Uh, not really sure what's going on there, but at least going forward, it should be fixed on PS4 and PS5. Now, another somewhat perplexing thing about the entire PS Plus relaunch has been Sony's indifference, as in they haven't really been promoting it the kind of way you would expect a company to promote a major service relaunch. Instead, we've gotten, you know, the occasional blog post, some short B-roll clips on YouTube, and we don't find out what game catalogs are until they launch in that region. So it's been strange, but now that PS Plus, uh, the relaunch has gone global, so it's everywhere now, um, maybe this is when they'll kick off a true marketing program because they just uploaded a new advertisement called Why Be One Thing When You Can Be Anything, where we see a man uh, leave this restaurant and he goes home, and sure enough, there's a bunch of, you know, cool little PlayStation nods, references, and paraphernalia hidden throughout his entire uh, residence. And it's super cool to see. I like these live action ones where they hide some, you know, cool references to pick out, um, kind of like the one that we had somewhat recently in the 2021 PlayStation Showcase. So these are always cool to see, but maybe now they'll kick off a true marketing um, program more or less. But I mean, my curiosity at this point really is what those mid-month refreshes look like for the extra and premium tiers. You know, how many classic games get added? How often do extra games leave the service? Will they get over a thousand titles? Will it stay around 800? Um, you know, how often will they do day and date, uh, kind of like mid-budget games, uh, sort of like Stray? Um, I really want to see what this looks like long term. Of course, we'll have to wait, but um, I am curious to see how committed they are to making this service, as I like to call it, a, a good value proposition to what would be an engaged PlayStation customer. Now, moving on to our next news story, if you remember from last week's episode, we talked about Tom Henderson's report for tryhardguides.com, where Sony has some some kind of hardware announcements later this month, and uh, that may or may not include a PS5 Pro-style controller, but now we have a better idea of what those announcements are, because not only did three headsets leak online, but then we also got a report again from Tom about um, two monitors. So, 
The, the headsets initially leaked from 91mobiles.com and there is indeed three different models. So they're all under this new Inzone product branding. So that would be the Inzone H3, H7, and H9. The H3 will be the only wired model and features 360 spatial sound for gaming. It also sports USB-C, ambient sound modes, and a USB splitter cable. The H7 will have a wireless option and basically everything else the H3 did, except this will also include a game chat uh, mixer button, and it should also have better battery life compared to the upper model, which would be the H9. That will have mostly everything apart from the better battery life, but it will also have a noise canceling setting. As for the two monitors, Tom Henderson writes for xputer.com that one will be 4K 144 Hz, the other 1080p at 240 Hz. They will apparently be marketed as a perfect match for PS5 with full VRR support, low latency, auto HDR tone mapping, auto genre picture mode, an FPS counter, black equalizer, and more. And Tom later clarified on Twitter that the rumored PS5 Pro Controller will not be announced at this upcoming Sony event, but there will be a Valorant partnership with Sony, and that does not include a Valorant announcement on PS5, but there will be some sort of uh, Valorant-Sony partnership there, and uh, this was all put out there before the confirmation of Sony's event, which will debut June 28th. And that is the distinction to make here is that this is a Sony event, not a PlayStation one. So that's where I'm seeing some get a bit confused on what this is. Uh, granted the pictures of the headsets look very much like they carry the PS5 design language, but this is likely also them just having more collaboration efforts between their uh, different divisions, which we've seen in recent years. And uh, even going back to PS5's launch, there was that uh, marketing tie-in with PS5 and their TV. So this might be similar. Um, I wouldn't expect this to be like uh, the stereoscopic 3D TV for PS3, where that was, that was very much billed as a PlayStation product instead of a Sony Electronics one, but these are very likely just gonna be a good range of headsets and monitors for whatever you wanna use them for. And at least for the monitors, I would be very interested in seeing you know, how good they are. There's a lot of uh, great options right now when it comes to 4K, 144 hertz, um, but if they get the price point down, the build quality, if it looks nice, they might have something really good, especially if there is some more unique uh, tight PlayStation integration. Um, so there's uh, at least the way it's sounding with the auto HDR tone mapping, the FPS counter, um, you know, I'm, my interest is peaked. So um, yeah, I would love to see that. So we'll see what happens, but um, at least for right now, we can't necessarily say these are PlayStation products, but either way, something to be on the lookout for uh, June 28th. Now, something else that should be announced very soon is a God of War Ragnarok release date with a possible new trailer or state of play or something. Uh, we saw Jason Schreier recently put out that Bloomberg article citing three different sources claiming that the game is going to get a release date announcement by the end of this month. And now we have at insider underscore WTF on Twitter, the snitch themselves posting a new GIF of Kratos where it loops over and it says uh, one, 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 zero, which is a uh, binary for the number 30. And so everyone's kind of putting two and two together here, you know, 30, June 30th, that's the end of June, falls on a Thursday. Sony typically likes to have state of plays on Thursdays. So maybe an announcement is on Monday for a state of play on Thursday. Um, also, you know, Corey Barlog's been way more active on Twitter lately. So it seems like something's coming very soon, which was kind of expected. And this also lines up with the running theory for how this account has this info, which, you know, I mentioned it last week, how I don't want to like just say it out loud and put more heat and attention on this account. But, you know, it's also something where they're just getting so big as is. So um, for those that, you know, didn't pick up on it, you know, the theory is that they have some sort of access into YouTube's uh, metadata or looking at unlisted or private videos. Um, um, which would line up with how they had this info, you know, days before major events where the videos might be, you know, uploaded and, you know, they're put as unlisted or privated beforehand. That's very common. Everybody does that. Um, that would also explain how, you know, for overdose, it's like somebody else knew that. So maybe they saw it beforehand and went with that. Um, also, they didn't know about Miles Morales on PC, which was only announced on the PlayStation blog. So that's the running theory, but that's not really important right now. The, the point is that, uh, well, we've got more and more mounting evidence that for God of War, we should be finding out very soon uh, when the game is releasing and also uh, having some new footage as well, which is really exciting. Now getting into our next story, we have more details on Final Fantasy 16, where if you remember after that last trailer came out, 
the game's producer, Naoki Yoshida, mentioned that they would be doing a bit of a press junket here and answering questions across uh, various sites like IGN, GameSpot, uh, also the Square Enix blog, the PlayStation blog. And so recently he did that, and now we have a lot more answers and uh, information surrounding this game. So, well, first off, we can say that the next trailer is expected this fall, so not going to be too long of a wait there to see more gameplay. And they will be pursuing a mature rating in most regions so they can fully explore the themes they want to without any restrictions. The story will follow the protagonist Clive Rossfield through his teens, 20s, and 30s. This is in the context of the game being more self-contained without needing additional content to understand the world and lore, and contrary to how the game may have been described before or how it was displayed, it does indeed still have party members, but they will be controlled by the AI and battle alongside Clive, or trade banter and whatnot, sort of what you'd expect in that situation, and the game itself is not open world, but it does still have larger areas to create that sense of global scale. In terms of the action-heavy gameplay and how, if this isn't really your thing, they will have a comprehensive support system in place for those players, so that might be something worth trying depending on what that looks like and the econ battles are well they're huge as we saw in the recent trailer but the econ battles have different stages they're all unique and feel different and defeating one will grant you their abilities and skill tree now, over on the PlayStation blog, Naoki was asked about what it's like working with PS5 hardware, and he said, and I quote here, With the boost in processing power, we can obviously make the graphics even richer than we could before, but it's the super fast loading times that really impress me. In Final Fantasy 16, you jump straight from story cutscenes into real-time battles and back again without any loading times, making the gameplay flow at a breakneck pace. So I think we can safely say at this point, this game is certainly breaking the mold when it comes to what to expect from a mainline Final Fantasy entry, where they're doing you know a handful of things that are much different than prior entries. But well, in recent titles, we've seen that they have certainly you know shied away from certain um, you know certain things that you kind of expect out of these games. Uh, you know, namely the big one for a lot of people where it was a problem was the you know turn-based combat, and I was certainly in that camp of you know I prefer turn-based combat JRPGs. I still do, by the way, um, but that was something where it was kind of like a, it instantly turned me off. Um, you know, nowadays I'm coming around, it's fine, it's uh, fun to a degree. Um, it's just how they go about actually doing it and making the uh, controls feel good and uh, having that gameplay loop really put you into a position where it feels fun and engaging in that moment-to-moment -moment combat in between all the uh, the story beats. And so if they can continue that, I'm, I'm still on board. But there's something about this game in particular. I don't know what it is exactly, whether it's the, the presentation or the story that they've laid out so far. But with this, um, Rebirth, Crisis Core, it's like I said before, there's just uh, kind of a renaissance going on with this franchise that, you know, for me, I haven't felt it in a long time, and I feel like I'm not the only one that shares that sentiment. So um, very excited for this game in particular. Still going to be a bit, but at the very least, we're, you know, we're, we're not going to have to wait too long for, for more info on this game where it is slated for summer 2023, and hopefully they can hit that uh, release window no problem. Moving on to our next news story, over on the SI Corporate blog, they recently ran a studio profile on Ember Labs, the developers behind uh, Cane and Bridge of Spirits, where uh, they went into the founding, where it was uh, founded in 2009 by Mike and Josh Greer, uh, two brothers that, you know, they made that company for animation and content creation, and then eventually they wanted to make a game, and that's where they created a pitch and sent it to Sony, and um, they talked a bit about what that experience was like, and so we have a very interesting quote here from Josh Greer, where he says, uh, after our presentation, I I think the team at SIE and PlayStation immediately saw the potential in our title, and I think that speaks a lot about who they are as publishers. They saw the potential even in the early phase, they fostered it and wanted to see it flourish. They have been our champions from the very beginning and knew we had something special to share with the world. Now, stories like this, they're always so great to hear, and also not the first time we've had a story like this where it's a smaller team and they're pitching to many publishers, and oftentimes they want to land at Sony, that's their first choice, and let's say they get it, and they always report back a really good experience working with Sony, they have their, you know, Sony has their full support, um, they give them creative freedom, you know, we hear this so often, uh, largely because it's true, uh, and granted, you're always going to hear the good stuff before the bad stuff, and there is, you know, situations where there is some bad stuff that pops up, but that's rare given the situation. It's just that we see this so often, and it's almost to a point where I want to flip the script and see more examples of developers that, say, pitched to Sony, and Sony said no, 
but they were able to find a different publishing partner. And you know, what were those games? What was the quality of those games? Um, you know, is it something where Sony is missing out on a lot of bangers, or do they genuinely have a very good eye for what are you know really exciting creative ideas? And I would venture a guess and say they likely do have a very good hit rate, but certainly they've you know probably said no to some. Uh, very big names and franchises and there are some um, certainly in the back burner that we could uh, talk about in a, in a later video but at least for you know this situation always great to see um, even something where let's say Sony and Ember Labs don't work again in a big way or, or something right it's just that even beyond that when you have any platform holder supporting a you know small developer in a big way let's say it's their first project or in this case an animation studio that want to make their first game so they have no track record making you know something that is an interactive experience um, as long as that project really lands I mean now they have this bargaining chip going to going into their next project and looking for another publisher and saying you know look at what we did before look at who we worked with before um, that brings more developers into this business uh, so I love seeing stuff like this and Ember Labs uh, they totally deserve it now in a very similar story this time for Housemark the senior narrative designer at Housemark Evie Corhonen was speaking with Jordan Midler of Video Games Chronicle talking about you know many aspects of Returnal and Housemark the game's launch how they're doing and in the context of you know writing a narrative for Housemark and what that means for Returnal and beyond and what they can do after Returnal um, she delivered a very interesting quote here where she says we didn't quite know what Returnal was going to be when we started building it now that we figured it out and that formula works so well we're looking at what's next now that we've been bought by Sony, we have a runway to go even wilder with all that financial backing and stability. Um, now, for those that didn't see when we talked about this, but it was confirmed quite a bit ago that they are working on a new IP, so it's not going to be Returnal 2, but they did confirm in these round of VGC interviews that certain aspects of Returnal and things that weren't in the game or that were on the cutting room floor might make it into that next project, which, not surprising, you know, most developers will probably tell you some degree of that happens for all their games where uh, whatever is on that cutting room floor, animations, game modes, ideas, whatever, they always try and uh, fit some of that into the next game, and so that will be the case here. But when, but when it comes to that next game, it's uh, really encouraging that they do have that runway with Sony where they can go even wilder, as she describes it. Um, this is why it was such uh, good news to hear Housemark being acquired. And, you know, bear in mind, with acquisition stories and all that news happening nowadays, right, it's always a little weird and a bit of a, a rock and a hard place where... You don't want a big, massive company to buy up all these smaller companies, but in certain contexts, it makes you know a lot of sense, and it's uh, very exciting for everybody involved, including fans. Where Housemark was in a bit of a sticky situation for a bit there, where they were doing you know top-down arcade games, but eventually you know the marketplace wasn't really buying those types of games. They they decided, okay, we got to move away from arcade, do something really different. Returnal is a very different kind of game, and most publishers would be very scared of touching that kind of project and giving it a decent budget to make sure that it, it works and it's going to really thrive. Um, Sony stepped in, and they did that, and they believed in them. Um, and Returnal did very well given what it is, right? It's not a multi huge multi-million seller, but for what it is... Um, did really well uh, so I cannot wait to see what Housemark does next it's gonna be a while yes but uh, in terms of all of PS Studios Housemark is always gonna be very high for me and Returnal is a big part of that reason next up if you still haven't seen the Uncharted movie then good news for you if you're in the US and have a Netflix account the movie's coming to Netflix on July 15th, um, which I guess if you're not in the US, you could still use a VPN and just change it over. But yeah, finally coming to Netflix. Uh, this is something where I know a lot of people that like they want to see it, but they just don't have that drive to like obviously buy the Blu-ray or even rent it digitally. Uh, so it is one of those things where if it's on Netflix, Hulu, wherever it goes to, and if you happen to have that uh, service, then then it's worth watching. And I would say yes. It's I still think it's worth trying. Um, if you don't like it, I totally get it, but I still thought it was a enjoyable Uncharted movie, which as a one-time thing, it was fun to watch. I don't know if I'd sit through it again, but uh, I had a good time with it. Moving on, Sony has recently confirmed to the German publication Games Wirtschaft that they will not be at Gamescom this year, they will not be at the physical event, and they will not be at Jeff Keighley's Gamescom opening night live, which 
Uh, keep in mind, in prior years, they've been there for first-party game announcements with uh, trailers, release dates, things like that, and most recently, Jeff Keighley's Summer Game Fest, where, you know, The Last of Us Part 1 was their closer. So they certainly could have been there in theory, but we have confirmation they will not um, be present at all. So uh, the good news here, at least, is that we can set expectations appropriately, and at least for, you know, with Sony and their first-party announcements, we can already get a good benchmark of what they likely will do at this point because i mean we're looking at god of war relatively soon um psvr 2 still has to have something uh whether it's its own dedicated event or you know if they continue to piecemeal that stuff out with you know ps blog stuff and psvr 2 announcements uh next to regular 2d ps5 games in state of plays i still think we need some sort of dedicated showcase for it i'd be shocked if we didn't get that but, um, you know, that might be slated for Q1 of next year. And so that has to happen eventually before Q1, right? Um, so there's that. And then, of course, the expected September showcase, which is close enough to August uh, where Gamescom takes place. So seems like they want to save everything they've got for their own showcase, which is fine. That's close enough as is. But at least we can set expectations appropriately. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter, and if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below. Support on this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories that I wanted to talk about with you all from this past week. And our Tuesday video was a another game collection update. That's number eight. And uh, yeah, I had some pricey buys on that one. Uh, trying to complete a certain series in there. So it's not going to not gonna be cheap. But um, you can go check that out. And then uh, yesterday we did the look at the UK's PS Plus relaunch. And as always, another video on Tuesday. And maybe another surprise Sony announcement. We'll see. But until then, that's it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Bonecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday. Thank you.